Positive Filter with your host, Philip Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help around the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope that what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, boys and girls, it's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. Uh, this is a first for the podcast. I'm actually recording remotely uh, with my first international guest uh, who's in the Singapore. So shout out. That's a crazy, crazy distance. Um, so we have with me uh, Gopaka, and we connected through our friend Kevin Ma uh, a while ago, and I was on her show. Um, a while ago, her web show in Singapore, or no, I wasn't in Singapore, uh, but now she's on Positive Filter, so we're doing a little collab. I was on her show, now she's on my show. So for the listeners, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Pika, and the brand name is Ross Off One, and um, I was actually based in the U.S. for about 20 years. I went to school with Kevin, um, which is the gentleman that Phil actually mentioned earlier, um, and I've been following him, so... As he mentioned, it was a mutual arrangement. We got to know each other through Kevin. And then, yeah, I I definitely had you on as a guest. Uh, It was a live IG um, feed where I got to talk to you about Positive Filter and the kind of work you're trying to do. And um, that's basically it. We kind of bonded over a lot of the same values. And um, I'm just excited to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, so this episode, obviously, you're an uh, international uh, woman. I would, I wouldn't say one of them in mystery, but you're, you know, that's like the spy thing. But, um, <laughs> uh, but you, you, uh, I definitely wanted to, to kind of. This episode was about you know coming to the states and then going back home again. So, uh, for the listeners, you're in Singapore presently. Can you tell us uh, about your your travels when you know coming to the states sure. and then and all that, you know, go to the background. Of course. Um, So I was born here in Singapore, which is pretty much the equator, uh, middle of Asia. I'm really proud of our country because lots and lots of different cultures here in Singapore, and it's easy to, you know, to get around. It's the cleanest city in Asia, so I'm really proud of that. But because of my dad and his work, we ended up moving around a lot. So my dad's a civil engineer, and he's kind of one of those people that can't really stay in one place for too long. So I've moved around a lot and then I eventually ended up in the U S so I moved from Singapore to London, which is where my dad was doing his studies. Once he graduated, we moved to Australia. I lived in Australia for about five years. And uh, from there we ended up moving to Indonesia. I lived there for about a year. And then my dad suddenly was like, yo, you know, we haven't seen my mom in a long time. Why don't we go visit? And my mom, uh, my grandmother actually lives in Virginia. She lives in Buckingham County. So I was in Virginia for about 20 years. That's the longest I've been anywhere. So it was quite the experience. When did you first come to the United States? You said for 20 years. So what grade was that? I was in eighth grade. I came in 1994. Mm. (laughs) Oh, wow. So quite the adjustment. So right into middle school. Pretty much. And it was one of those situations where I was like, you know, once we moved and he decided, okay, do you want to take, you you want to start school here? And I was like, yeah, okay, but here's the deal. I'm not moving anymore because this is middle school, high school. I don't want to, I don't want to continue to move. Right. So what high school was that? Uh, It was Fuqua School in Farmville, what used to be Prince Edward Academy. Oh, my Lord. Fuqua School. Farmville. So you went from international (laughs) world traveling to Farmville, which is country. Um, and I ain't going to yeah. hold on. So, uh, what about, so for that transition, uh, what about people of color? So I know you, you, you've come from Indonesia and London. All these are very diverse metropolitan yeah. areas to yeah. Farmville. What was that adjustment like for you? It was definite culture shock because among, among other things, it wasn't just, you know, color where we, we went, we came down to like just two colors, either you were black or you were white, or there was no in between. It was one or the other. Um, yep. But there was also a lot of cultural differences as in, I come from a very Eastern culture where there's a lot of respect. It's very maternal driven. Um, you mm-hmm. had uniforms for school and stuff like that. And suddenly there was no uniform. Um, mm-hmm. People don't refer to 
anyone that's older than you as uncle or auntie or older brother or older sister. <laughs> yeah. So that was very strange. People look at me like, why? I don't know you. Why you talk to me like that? But my mom would kill me if I didn't call you uncle or something or auntie something. Right. Yeah. I did that a lot too. Yeah. I mean, I used to, my, my wife jokes, she's like, how many people are your uncles? Because I call all my dad <laughs> play uncle, uncle something. Yeah. That was just a way of saying, like my dad's buddies, I'd call them uncle something. And they weren't even my uncle. So I understand that culturally. Like, the, the community and family and, and different things. Um, and I, I bet that was trying to transition. Um, you said the two categories of black or white and Farmville. Did you feel a pull to have to decide who you hung out with like that, like the black people? Actually, or white no. People? Um, and I'm kind of grateful for that because our – I graduated from class of 64. It was really Oh, wow. Cool. That's that really cool. Like I said, it was back when Fuqua just kind of started. It was maybe like the first or second year that it became a private school. Um, and I didn't get pulled into one or the other. I was kind of an outsider all around. I didn't fit into anyone, so I didn't fit, it, yeah. fit in anywhere. So I was kind of like one of those kids. I, I stuck to the teachers because school was what I understood. Um, I was, I guess I was teacher's pet in a lot of classes. Um, only because moving from school to school all the time, I just, I didn't fit in with any of the kids anywhere around the world. It was, I stuck to what I knew, which was schoolwork. What, so you said that, did you, what was, you know, before eighth grade, did you, where, what place did you like the most uh, before eighth grade, before the United States? Um, the longest I spent anywhere for school was actually in Australia, but even then I wasn't anywhere for more than six months. I moved oh, wow. to maybe 10 different schools in five different countries before I hit eighth grade. Well, Lord, that's a, quite a, that's like more, that's more transitions than me. And I'm a military kid. At least in the military, I got to stay every place at least two years. So that's a, right. I can tell that's quite a transition, but at the same time it's exposed you, that worldliness exposed you to different cultures. You're more adaptable probably, right? Um, would you I am with regard to re uh, to reinventing myself. Yes, absolutely. I can fit into new. I don't. I'm not worried yeah. about new situations. For me, it's more like, all right. Well, how do I maintain friendships after a certain period of time? Yes. Because yeah. if I make a mistake, how I can't like up and leave and then leave it behind. I kind of got to mend the relationship. So that was. Different. I did that. Well, I mean, I think that's true too. I learned long distance friendships and having to maintain relationships. Luckily, with the internet and all that, it was e it's getting easier. But back in the day, now, yeah. it was hard, you know, because I was a military kid. I think there's so many friends out there that I met that I, you know, I'll never see again. And I always wish that if I had the internet, I probably would have kept in touch with a lot more people uh, yeah. than I did in elementary school. Um, yep. So, what was uh, when you were about to come to the United States, right? Obviously, you had an outsider lens. What did you think of the United States, or what was, you know, ingrained in you? Did you think it was you know, the land of uh, milk and honey, the American dream. Did you see? I like, wasn't thinking in that manner. I wasn't even thinking about opportunities. I mean, I was in yeah. eighth grade. I was trying really yeah. hard to just fit in and not stand out, which is the opposite now, obviously. But right. um, even then, I lived in a place where it was very inclusive. I lived in a place called Yogaville, Virginia. Have you heard of that? Oh, uh, no. And I lived in Virginia a long time, so I don't know. <laughs> I heard of farm. It's in the middle of yeah, it's in the middle of Buckingham County, um, and okay. it's an ashram set up by um, a gentleman called Swami Satchidananda, and he actually is very close to my family. So when my grandmother left Sri Lanka after the riots, he actually went with her. So mm -hmm. when he, uh, he was the gentleman that opened Woodstock 69, he created a community in Yogaville um, where everyone of every nationality, faith, you know, whatever religion, however you pray, it doesn't matter. All of us come together and we live peacefully. There is no drinking, there's no smoking, there's no hunting in the middle of Buckingham County, which is hard. So it's private property mm -hmm. and it's very, very comfortable. Um, it's very inclusive. It's very um, accommodating. So where I might have seen it differently if I didn't have that background, um, yeah. I, didn't have such a, I didn't have such a hard time. So, it could have been worse. Yeah, it could have been worse. And what about the, you know, like the outside news, you know, like uh, – um, from the outside looking in, you know, I know now I, I keep in touch with my people from the UK um, and they have a quite a perception of the United States at this moment. Uh, shout out to our government. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But, but let's, we're not going to talk about current politics, but what was, was there any perception that you had of America back then? 
Oh, before absolutely. You came. Um, I was I was that? raised uh, during Reagan's presidency. That's where you know that's where the first information about the U.S. came up. And I mean, from there onwards, it was yeah you know, okay. There were a couple of, like situations that weren't so great for you know your PR, but for the most part, everyone saw the U.S. as um, the example. Um, yeah, this okay. is how cultures are supposed to be. This is mm-hmm. where people come to get a fresh start. That was the land of milk and honey, honestly. Yeah, but yeah. Now, or the American dream or whatever. Unfortunately, dropped a little. Yes, the yeah. American dream, yes. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry, obviously I don't think that's quite the case anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you all you needed was a dollar and a dream back then. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, and, and so you came and you're you know, going through – and you decided to look at colleges. I, I like to jump around. We're going to jump around in this episode. Sure. But you started looking at colleges. What were some of the things that you looked for when you were thinking about colleges? Um, and particularly, you could have decided to go back to another country for college. Why did you decide to stay in the United States for college? Um, I stayed in the States because I had two younger brothers. So my middle brother is four years younger than me, and my youngest is 10 years younger than me. So because I had two little brothers um, in the U.S. anyway, they were already, you know, high school and, and elementary school at the time, I figured just to stay around, because we've, we've never been separated. We've always we've lived in the same room forever until, like, you know, uh, until I was maybe 16. And even then, we did everything together. So I didn't want to leave them behind, um, even okay. though I was staying, off, you know, on campus and stuff. And honestly, because I didn't come from, you know, a wealthy background or anything, I was looking for schools that offer scholarships, to be very gotcha. honest. Gotcha. So true, true. Either you or Bridgewater. <laughs> I, well, oh, man, you didn't choose Richmond. What, what, okay, then you had the two choices. Why didn't you choose the city school rather than Bridgewater? Uh, because Bridgewater offered me more money. All hey, right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it That's true. About the money. Yeah, it's about the money. So then if you're saying you're so, I mean, you are, I'm not saying you are, like, it's questioning, you are close to your family. So when you got to Bridgewater, did you come home often? Um, whenever I could, and obviously that was dependent upon whether my mom would come get me or not. And that meant you oh. know, all holidays, so I definitely went home. Um, we oh, so you didn't have a whip? Time. So you didn't no. have a whip? No whip? I didn't get my license till I was 20. <laughs> hey, dang. All right. I was scared to drive. You're scared? Well, I mean, I don't think... Yeah, driving's not that fun. And when and I you know, if I could, if I was rich, I'd have someone drive me all the time. I don't understand why people <laughs> this, is, this is a random tangent, but I don't understand why people like celebrities get DUIs because if I was rich, I would never drive. Ever. You'd have a driver, I, yeah. Then you can I do what ha- you want to do, but you get where you need to go. <laughs> I'd have a dr- I would have legit have a private driver or just have a the highest Uber tab ever because I don't like, <laughs> I really don't like driving. I just I have to. Um, so you went to Bridgewater. What did you study at Bridgewater? I was a psych major. What made so you I started choose? I was a bio major, um, and eventually I got to a point where I just I didn't care about chemistry. I liked botany, but not that much. So I was just like, all right, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to graduate with this. So I moved to psych- psychology. Is what I wanted to study in the first place. So. What you like, people? I love people, and I come from a very difficult background. So understanding why people did some did what they did was very mm-hmm. important to me. Mm-hmm. Did you ever have the? Did you ever want to go into the helping profession, like therapy or counseling or something like that? Honestly, what I wanted to do was get on the counseling track, and it was either it was mm-hmm. between uh, guidance counseling or actually therapy. And I looked at region afterwards, but then life took a different tangent. So you know, it's all good. Oh well, maybe that's a good p- pivot. So what what did life pivot and tangent? For um, you? I was. I was dating someone at the time, and he went off. He was he was from West Point, so he went back to West Point. He was in the banking industry, um, but I decided to stay on at Bridgewater for a year after I graduated because I wasn't ready for real life. I mean, they say you know go get your college education, suddenly you're in debt, and then you need to go find an apartment and a job and all these. I was not ready for that, so right. I babied myself a little bit, and I became residence director for a year. So I was in charge of a dorm of 100 and, 104 girls. Mm-hmm. And from there, you know, to make extra money and to get extra, you know, experience. Because here's the thing, right? You graduate, and the first thing people look for when they're looking for a job is, you know, when they're looking to hire you is, how much experience do you have? I just graduated. I have the degree. I don't have the experience. And the other flip side is a lot of people have the experience. They don't have the degree. So I figured I'd get some experience. Um, I worked for the retirement community under, um, under the VP of HR and decided to go ahead and get my uh, my professional human resources management cert from Villanova, which I did online. And then mm-hmm. from there, I decided guidance counseling might be easier. It might be more mm-hmm. suited to what I wanted to do. So I went ahead and got my master's in education while I was uh, doing that as well. Where did you get the master's? 
uh, American Intercontinental University. It was the first online master's. <laughs> oh, first oh, shoot. So how was that for you, like, studying without uh, remotely? Um, was it, it was are you good, self actually, Are you self-motivated? I think I am. I'm, I'm pretty good with that. Uh, it was back when they had first started using chat groups and stuff to kind of, you know, motivate everybody yeah. to get, you know, to get along and get it done and stuff. Um, it was good because I'm self-paced. If I'm ready to, you know, if I'm in a mood where I can, like, sit down and get it all knocked out, I will get it all knocked out. Um, but I'm actually really glad I didn't take any time in between graduation from a physical, you know, uh, yeah. a, an old school facility versus online because if I had taken that time off, I probably wouldn't have come back to get all those degrees. Yeah, you 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 were in study mode. Yep. So what was and your? I had the time. <laughs> so what was your first? As we say, besides the R R D position, a resident director or whatever resident, what was your first big girl job right after college or after that? Rack room shoes. Rack room shoes. <laughs> what was that? Where? where? Rack room shoes in uh, in Williamsburg. Williamsburg. So you're all over the map of Virginia. Yeah. You know, Charlottesville, the, the 504, the 804, the 757, the 434. You, you ever do 703 up here? You ever live up here? No, I wasn't in Nova. Um, my my boyfriend, at the, my ex fiance at the time, ended up being a uh, state trooper out in Daleville. Daleville, right? Yeah, Daleville. Dale, <laughs> but I Dale, didn't move up there with him. About Dale City? Dale City, that's what it was. I'm sorry. I was about to say Dale Daleville. City. Oh, like, okay, maybe Danville? That's right. down there, too. You're all over the map. I told you, 20 years ago, yo. <laughs> so so you, you did that, and, you know, before I pivot, I mean, I know this probably jumping, jumping the gun. What was the transition between graduating and, you know, if you want to do the cliff notes, you want to do the long version, between here and going back to Singapore and going back? I mean, because you just recently went back, right? How 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 far, how soon ago? I went go? back in 2013. So, so that's all. That's, that's that's so there's a gap in there between college and that though. There's a big gap. So I graduated oh. in 20, uh, 2003. Yeah. And like I said, Rack Room was the first job, and once I found a better gig, you know, I moved in that. So I worked for Kingsmill. I worked at Kingsmill Resort and Spa out in Williamsburg. Um, no. I did banquets and contracts and sales. I ended up teaching in the spa. I taught yoga in the spa for a couple of years. And then I had a situation where I needed to decide whether I was going to carry on, even though they weren't going to give me <laughs> the yearly raise. I was fighting over 15 cents. Uh, and then I was like, you know what, forget it. Let me go look at a completely different, you know, company. And I ended up working for Fairfield Resorts, which is now Wyndham Vacation Ownership. So I wanted to Yeah, Fairfield. There. I know. They're down there, right? Yeah, I heard of them. Yep. So I worked for them. I worked for the, uh, the director of marketing, and then I kind of that was where the tangent kicked in. Uh, I ended up in marketing for a many a great many years. So event planning, marketing, community marketing. Um, I ran their front line, their um, their community marketing agents. I did their payroll. I did a lot of I got a lot of exposure that way, and I liked what I was doing. Business so, exposure. Yeah. Eventually, what happened was they shut down their front line, and so we went. That that was my first. Um, first set of layoffs that I've ever been through. And that was a very panicky situation. I was not happy with that. So uh, from there, I went about six months without getting a job, even though I had all of my you know, qualifications and some real world experience. Uh, but eventually what happened was uh, I was placed uh, with a temp agency with Lumber Liquidators. So I worked for Lumber Liquidators for about four years before they went through a set of layoffs as well. Lord. But that was a different set of that was a different set of, you know, skills. I ended up being a senior data analyst. I went through an SAP launch, which I'd never talked or seen SAP before, but that was kind of interesting too. Like I, I have a head for numbers. I can sit in a closet and do paperwork if that's necessary. So that was kind of cool too, um, that experience. And when I went through that layoff is when it really hit home, I couldn't really do this on my own. I, I had to have a backup plan. Um, when I was at Wyndham, I had actually met my now ex-husband, and he was sales and I was marketing, and we would, you know, knock stuff out together, but he was also frontline. So when I went through a layoff, he was laid off maybe a month after I was. So at that point, he had his own kids. I was taking care of them. It was difficult, but in between all of that, we somehow ended up married. Um, I had my daughter, you know, raising stepkids, trying to fit into, you know, baby mamas and their families' cultures, trying to assimilate and actually make, you know, a blended family somewhere where the kids felt like was home. That mm -hmm. was difficult, but, you know, we got that done. And eventually we found that there were some things that were just not going to change, and I, I left and came home. 
So that was a big decision. When you went and came home, did you you left the stepkids and just brought your your I hate this. I don't know what you call it. My daughter. Full kid, full, yeah, I say like your full yeah. kid, your step kid, your full kid, whatever. But yes, yeah. Sorry. My biological daughter. Yeah, yeah biological um, daughter. What ended up so happening smart. was, um, in the state of Virginia, step parents don't have any rights unless they adopt the child, which yes. I was not allowed to do. Um, so I had no choice. I mean, the kids wanted to come with me, but it wasn't like I was in a position where I could financially take care of them or bring them back home with me. And I definitely did not have his blessing to do that. So I just kind of left it be. So what I ended up doing was um, I ended up coming home. I had I had been through, unfortunately, I had I lived through a couple of abortions and I was super depressed, but I was still with baby girls. So I came home to see my family. I needed to get away for a little bit and kind of clear my head. Meanwhile, he had separated, uh, he had filed for separation within a month of me leaving. And um, no, the day I left, I think like the week after we called and caught up and he was like, yeah, I filed for separation. I was like, okay then. So that's where I just kind of ended up staying here instead of going back home. So it was almost as a trip and then you just stayed there? Yep. Now when you, that was a quite a decision. Who was your supports when you went to Singapore? Who were you staying with? My mom happened to be based out here at the time. So um, okay. while I was in college, between college and my, you know, my first real job and everything, my brother went off to college, my middle brother mm -hmm. went off to college, and then my mom and my youngest brother came back uh, to Bali. Okay. They were in Bali for a while, and then they moved back to Singapore. So okay. when I came here, it was because my mom was already here. My mom's side of the family has been here the whole time. They they don't move. They visit places, okay. but they don't you know they haven't moved out. So I had a pretty strong support network here. My grandparents were still alive at the time, and I was actually raised by my my grandparents. So I had strong roots here. So when you came back and you were staying back. Uh, it seems like a, I mean that's a quite a leap of faith. Um, when did you know you made the right choice to stay? Because obviously it was kind of a not say a rush decision, but it wasn't like super planned. So when 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 into moving back home to Singapore, do you like this is it? I'm good. I'll stay here. Um, actually, once he said that he'd filed for separation, because I was over here like fighting with the idea of going back or staying. I didn't know what to do, and it was it was mm -hmm. one of those situations where I was like, you know, do I stay or do I go? Do I go back home? We were we were. I was remembering stuff like you know, um, when when I left, I was unemployed. And mm -hmm. it was one of those things where I had an unemployment check and I was taking care of the bills and stuff, but he was not helping at all. I could ask him for a hundred bucks for groceries or to get, you know, my stepdaughter's hair done. And he would be like, Oh, I need to take note of all these things, but I was handling all of it. Like I was handling all the bills and he would just pay the rent. Um, so it was one of those situations where I was like, you know, we were going through a really tough time. There were situations where we would get in the fights and baby girl would jump in the middle and be like, daddy, leave her alone. And her, seeing her do that was like, all right, this can't go on the way it is. So once we had that distance, we weren't in each other's faces, and to see how he reacted with me not being there, yeah, I realized that, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm just going to stay here then. Okay, so now, you know, we always think about career and stuff, so pulling that back into it, when you were there and you said, I'm decided to stay, what was like, did you immediately start looking for jobs, how that and how did the employment part? Not immediately. When I first came came here, it was more like I needed to I needed to heal. I needed to kind of yeah. yeah. get a grip on reality again because I was so upset about so many things. Um, it took me maybe six months to get my head out of my ass and figure out yeah. what was going on. Yeah. Um, to kind of really focus on taking care of my daughter and making sure that I I could sustain myself here. So yeah, then I started you know hitting the papers and sending my resume out. Lucky for me, I've never. Um, I never let go of my citizenship. I've always been a Singapore citizen, so I held a green card. Oh, wow. In the US. Okay. Wow. Okay. So, what's the job market like in Singapore? Is it difficult for a professional to get a job? It is. is so it, we're in the U.S. It, yeah. Where the U.S. promotes a diverse resume, Singapore mm. does not. If you what have want. a lot of experience in a lot of different situations, like a lot of different job sectors, they don't know where to place you. They're looking at you like. What you couldn't make up your mind? Why do you have so many different abilities? Yeah. Why are your skill sets so varied? Um, so here it's like you know you go to school to be uh, an accountant, you get jobs in the accounting field, you continue moving that direction. You don't yeah, rent, you don't yeah. yeah. So they're a little behind on that note. They're now coming around to the idea of okay, maybe you need more than just one skill set. So they're multi. You're not. We're not as. They're not as multidisciplinary 
as a, they're no. more track. They're more linear track. Um, yep. And once you're that, you're on that track for a while. Yeah. Like if you're a math person, you're going to be accounting and all that. If you're all that and a teacher, you're a teacher. Or an engineer. There are a lot yeah, of engineers out here. A lot of engineers. So so then you said you're hitting the papers and all that. What was some? What was your first job? Bouncing back on your My feet. My first job. Um, I ended up working for a company called Taste of Tradition. It was a small. Um, a smaller business, uh, not like a franchise or anything. So this was uh, one of Singapore's top 500. Okay. Uh, not even top 500, top 300. And he comes from money. He has his own wine business. And I ended up being an event planner for him. So I uh, had the opportunity to do a uh, champagne launch, uh, Charles Heidzik Champagne here in Singapore, because they're the sole distributor for Singapore. Um, and that was kind of interesting. But eventually um, what I found was small businesses here in Singapore while they know what they want, they don't know how to tell you exactly what they want. They know the big picture. They don't know like the you know the little things that would take you to get there. So we had a disagreement about values, and I left. Mm. After that, I ended up working for the Grand Hyatt. So hospitality, because of Wyndham and all that, I'm I'm used to. So I worked for the Grand Hyatt for two years. Um, I worked for the Grand Club, which is like the VIP guests, um, mm -hmm. taking care of them, being butlers and stuff. So we dealt with people like. Um, the Sultan of Brunei. We dealt with um, sheikhs from Dubai. We dealt with a lot of celebrities, and um, there were a lot of soccer teams that came through. Like we, we took care of all of them, um, and that was interesting. Only I did not fit into the culture. I stood out, and not in a good way. I did things a little more holistically, uh, a little more simply, and they didn't like the fact that I would not fit into their world. <laughs> so what do you mean? I think out of there. What do you mean? Like, what do you mean? They're like. Or too stuffy or too polite or what? I don't understand. What, what's the culture? No, no, no. I'm very genuine. I'm very genuine. I don't, I don't solicit um, um, feedback from guests. I don't ask them to rate me on this or mention my name here. Reviews on TripAdvisor, all that. I don't do that. Um, if I get to know the client or the guest, I will give them what's called small meaningful gestures. Um, do things that really mean something to them. So if I met kids, I would get to know what their favorite, uh, you know, cartoons were, and I would hand draw and make, you know, like you do your ill fill awards. I used to give framed pictures of stuff that I had traced and colored, and you know, made graphics yeah. for them. Which is not, not everyone had the time to do that, so they were upset that I was kind of breaking the mold on what we can and can't give to guests. But I'm, I'm cheap, okay. I don't like spending money, so whatever I can make, I'm just gonna make. And it's a lot more meaningful that way. And, and what did they want to do? They wanted you to like. Um, they wanted me to go through uh, room service and order strawberries, uh, or you know, yeah, gotcha. do uh, extra housekeeping stuff. It had to be gotcha. through the. I, I'm not like that though. That's not. It's generic. It doesn't show that I I know the guest. <laughs> so so you're you're finding your niche, and it seems like you're you're a, a, a mold. Do you feel like you fit in? Are you a you fit in Singapore culture, American culture? You're just like I'm a world person. Like it doesn't matter. I'll just finesse. It seems like there's. I'm a hot mess. I don't fit anywhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's life. I don't fit. But anywhere. that's okay though. Now I'm okay with that. Back when I was, you know, going through all these moves in school and stuff, that was different. Yeah. I did not want that. But now it's like, okay, I get to define life for myself. It doesn't have to fit into the way my uncles do things, and it doesn't have to fit into the way the U.S. does things. It's like a it's like a blend of everything. I get to pick and choose what I like and what fits me, mm -hmm. and I I create that. Right, right. I like that. So, what do you like about Singapore culture? Oh like my gosh, I love a lot about it. Actually, I love that there are so many different cultures here. Uh, the Chinese, the Malay, the Indian cultures. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. have their issues, but they generally get along, uh, mostly over food. Um, mm -hmm. They uh, they have a great transportation system. We have an affordable food market. Uh, a lot of them are uh, mm -hmm. fresh markets. So a lot of fresh fish, a lot of fresh vegetables and fruits. Even though we don't have any space to actually farm or anything, we get it shipped in, but it's still affordable. Like I can get spinach for like a dollar and 55 cents. Mm. I can get, um, I can get eggs for like, eggs are a little more expensive, but eggs are like $2 and some change. And it's funny, they don't use dozens, they use 10 eggs. So now they're kind of slowly switching over to plus two, so it's a dozen eggs. It's a little strange, but yeah, it's little things like that, though. Now, what are some things you, you know, a cons you don't like about Singapore culture? Um, or have some adversion to? In the U.S., you're allowed a little more freedom to kind of like, you know, pave your own way. Whereas Singapore, mm -hmm. you kind of have to, you have to fit into the system. So um, the 
the culture here is you are a working parent, both parents work, and you have a maid at home, which means the maid cleans and cooks, does laundry, picks up your kids, uh, brings them back home. So then y'all get to go party after work if you wanted to. But I'm, that's mm. not the kind of parent I am. Um, because I raised a blended family in the U.S., yeah, I had my own car and everything, but after work, they had you know, after school care, and I've made sure my daughter has the same thing. And now it's like I don't have a maid because when she's at work and my daughter's at school, what does she have to do but sit around the house and like fiddle with? I don't want that. I don't need, I'm not paying, you know, a salary for someone to just sit around the house until I get home. And I'm fully capable of cooking and making sure everything's taken care of. The other thing I realized is my daughter watches everything. You have a lot of snotty kids mm-hmm. out here in Singapore that talk shit to their parents because the maid's the one that's raising them, and I don't want that. Yeah, they got monies. Yeah. They got monies. So what's uh? I, I'm curious too. What's the outside perception? What's the uni- United States perception right now of America from Singapore? Do you really want me to say this out loud? Because yeah, you can. Laughing stock at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Why? Uh, we know why. Carrot Top is doing a hell of a job. He's doing a bang-up job of making sure his interests are taken care of, but the country is kind of like falling apart. Uh, okay. When people would have happily aligned with the U.S., they're doing double takes, and they would rather use the U.S. for memes instead. So what do you uh, – do you ever find yourself having to defend the United States or, you know, uh, or have to – I do. To, I do. Or have um, to, um, because I do love – I do love the culture. Like, let's put the government aside. Yeah, he's yeah. at the top operating and doing all this nonsense. But on the ground level, like, the school systems are great. Um, Montessori-based learning, uh, hands-on information. They really want you to go out there and get involved in the community. Uh, sports, oh, my God. Singapore sports, is yeah. really big on individual sports. So you have people like Joseph Schooling who are champion swimmers and everything. But you don't have – you don't have – team sports that much you don't you know right. if you didn't play yeah. in the school you have boys and girls club you have the ymca you have neighborhood you know little league and all that mm. they don't have that here there was nothing team sport about it and i think you learn so much as a kid being part of a team they don't have cricket they don't play cricket like that i don't know i'm, nah. just, I'm just assuming no nah, they don't they should but they don't uh they don't play or soccer tennis. like that either oh, they, play t- tennis. That's they, they have tennis but you have to okay so they're very very um school mind, education mind, they, they want you to take extra classes and extra tuitions mm-hmm. for, um, to make sure you get ahead in school. But they also do stuff like you have to pay to play soccer on the side. Mm-hmm. It's not part of the school. There's no, like, there's no league right. that you can be a part of. What about it's music? It's all very competitive. What about that? What's music the perception? is another thing. It's, it's yeah. extra. It's What's extra. Perce- it's not necessary, but it's extra. What's the perception of American music? And do people listen to rock um, over there? They do, but they're stuck in the 90s. <laughs> they listen to old, okay, they listen to old stuff. Yeah, cool. they're 90s R&B, 90s rap, they, they haven't really moved past that. And I'm actually okay with that because some of the music that's coming out, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't mind that. I, I don't think that'd be really that upset if I was stuck in the 90s. No. Cause I, I think, for honestly, that's the golden era of rap. But that's just me. And I feel old saying that, but some of that, nah. But some of that, some of those messages really, really resonated. Some of those messages were very relevant, and even now they're relevant. Um, I will say this though: I was listening to, I don't know if you uh, watched Into the Spider Verse with Miles. Yeah, that's my Rob favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That soundtrack is fire. I like that. A lot of the stuff that's coming out on that, you know, the messages on that soundtrack were really good too. Yeah. What about? Okay. So then we're talking about what the outside perception. <laughs> and we already said about the government. I know. I mean, that's. But what about just anything else? They like the culture. Do they like movies? Are you able to, I mean, not. A, of course, there's American movies that are really late. And what's the reception to American movies over there? Like, they love it. They love it. They, I mean, American movies still kind of run the culture here as far as cinema is concerned. You do have yeah. Korean stuff. You yeah. have a lot of Indian movies as well. But they're very open to all those things. They just, where um, I was watching The Hate You Give, and it was very relevant for me and my daughter, it probably doesn't resonate the way it did for me with yeah. the general community. I don't think people would have chosen that movie to watch. I don't think it hit theaters here. Got it. Excellent. So what about um, food? Food. Oh, my God. Diverse. Uh, you don't have a lot of – I miss Mexican food. I will say that. So I cook it myself. Oh, uh, uh, don't, don't have Mexican food like that. Food okay. from everywhere else. You don't have as much. You have, like, very – you have tapas maybe, but you don't have anything fast. You still have fast food here. You still have um, McDonald's, KFC. Mm-hmm. You have Texas chicken, which is probably 
close to Bojangles, not quite, but close. Um, you don't have Hardee's, but you have Carl's Jr. I don't know if you have Carl's Jr. out there. Maybe in yeah. some areas. Yeah, some some places got Carl's Jr. Yeah, uh, you have Domino's and you have um, Domino's and Pizza Hut, but the sizes <laughs> suck. They're really small. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's, that means they are. That, what they don't struggle with obesity like America, huh? Uh, they do. Okay, they do. Only All right. because food is cheap enough where they can buy tons. Okay, that's, uh, there you go. So you're you're looking from the outside in and you're doing this. Is what about the cost? Of, I mean, I'm I'm just gonna ask a lot of cultural questions. What about cost of living? Do you feel like you li- can you live like? <laughs> I'm gonna break it down. So to buy a house, super expensive. To buy a car, super expensive. Why though? Because we don't have a lot of land. Uh, a lot of people were renting, mm. not so bad. But Transportation-wise, we have an amazing transportation system. We have buses that are very timely. We have a, a subway that's very timely. You can get to any part of Singapore without much trouble. And then we have we have Uber, okay. uh, we have Grab, we have taxis, regular taxis. So there's no excuse for why you can't, you know, get to where you need to go. There's uh, Grab Share. There's Grab Shuttle. There's like there's a lot of options for transport. So, so you said food is cheap. So food, food is cheap. cheap. What about clothes and everything else? Uh, clothes aren't so bad. If you know where to shop, it's not so bad. But if you were to buy brand names like Victoria's Secret, it's worse than the, you know, the, what is it, the, oh, my gosh, the conversion rate. So uh, yeah. it's thirty Singapore to one U.S. dollar. But uh, okay. the, just to put it in context for you, so you can get, you know, 5 for 25 underwear-wise in, the, in Victoria's Secret in the U.S., but here it's like 5 for 50. Mm. So it's way more than the the markup. <laughs> so you don't live like a king over there. Like certain countries, your money goes further, but it's the opposite. Is that what I'm? I'm not... It's not like that. Uh, you can still live like a king, but it depends on your your concept of luxury. A lot of t- a lot of people here mm. consider luxury being you know you have a maid in the house. You can go for massages every week or daily if you wanted to. Um, you have AC in every room. You have TVs in every room. That's that's kind of luxury at that point. Um, oh wow! Okay. A car for every member. That, yeah, it's it's very expensive though to have a car. So we're looking at like half a mil to get a car. Mm, just to get a car, I'd rather walk or ride a bike. Exactly, but you have you have t- public transportation, so you can still get wherever you want. And taxi fare is not that bad, depending on the time of day. So you can get where you need to get. You just have to be you know smart about it. What about safety? Very safe. Um, to put it in perspective for you, I uh, used to work shift work at, at the Grand Hyatt, right? So mm-hmm. I would work night shift. I would get off at like, well, I should have been off at 11, but by the time you finish paperwork and stuff, it maybe be like 2, 3 in the morning. And I would walk home. It was a half an hour walk, and I would walk mm-hmm. home from Central Business District to where my grandparents were living at the time, and no one would bother me. Mm. What about uh, health and, and taking care of yourself and medicine? Um, here they are, they have two approaches. So people that are used to, you know, going to a doctor for everything and getting, you know, mm-hmm. chemical medicines and stuff, there's that track as well. For the, for the vast majority of people in Asia, if they want to get any kind of surgeries done, they come to Singapore to get it done because they can trust the, t- the doctors. There's no bribery. There's no n- nonsense. Uh, but also for the people that are a little more health conscious, if they want to do, um, natural medicines, like, uh, Chinese uh, traditional medicine, they yeah. have that available. They have Ayurveda, which is the, the Indian version of that, available. They have a lot of herbs and remedies and all of those things available as well. Mm. And then what's the primary religion? And uh, There's no primary religion because there are so many cultures. So uh, there is Muslim, yeah. a, a big Muslim community. There is a big Hindu community. And then there's a big uh, Buddhist community and Christian community as well because the Chinese are a, a bit of both. Mm, interesting. Uh, well, uh, how does your daughter? How did your daughter like the transition? Because she, she, as a child, she's able to experience both. So, what was her transition like? For her, to, it to was her fun. Life? For her, it was fun because we went from a place where you know it was a blended family, and I had I was happily alienated from my actual family in the states um, because I allowed him to do that. So it was either my stepson's side of the family or just us in our house. So we didn't have a lot of cousins and stuff that ran around that we could go visit. But here we have cousins everywhere. We have 
you know, perpetual summer. Sometimes it's really rainy, but otherwise we can go anywhere in Singapore at any time of the, you know, time of the day. We can go to the beach every day of the week if we wanted to. Um, Singapore is very health conscious in the fact that they have playgrounds in every neighborhood, and then they also have mm. exercise yards. So they're making sure that their elderly community stays active, moves around where they don't have to have a gym. So I don't need a gym membership. I can go downstairs and do pull-ups and, you know, there's different equipment around that I can use. So she's excited because every playground in every neighborhood is different from the last. So she gets, you know, oh, my God, there's a slide over here. Let me go over here. And, oh, my God, there's swings over there. Let me go over there. So it's exciting to her. Does she miss the States at all, though? She doesn't have that many memories, honestly. Mm, She remembers snow. She left when she was two. Oh, okay. Oh, she left when she was two. Oh, okay. What about the schools like? What are the schools like for her? Um, school. Very, very rigorous. Uh, they start school at mm. 7.30 in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, they finish at 1.45. So for people that are working that don't have a maid to go pick up the kids, they have to have student care. So she has student care. Um, they are very – they push. They push a lot. So she has a second language already. So she has spelling in Tamil, which is not – English characters is a completely different character. Every character has its own, um, sorry, every sound has its own character. So it's very different. So she has, she's pushed to speak in Tamil, to write in Tamil, to read in Tamil. She has spelling, like I said, every week. She has spelling for English as well. She's only in second grade. Um, and she has math. Next year they'll start doing science finally, and then they'll have exams as well. What language? Do you speak more than one language? Yeah, uh, because I moved around so much, I've learned seven different languages, but right now I can manage in Spanish, but I speak Tamil and English. Tamil and English. Oh, wow. And so what are you doing? uh, What are you doing now uh, professionally? Uh, Professionally right now, I am actually working for myself finally. And honestly, because I'm still in the beginning phases, it's not like I'm like making a bank, but I'm making enough to, to get by. It's not like I'm suffering either. I don't need an infusion of cash from anywhere. I don't have any personal loans. I'm just, I'm working it. Um, so at the moment, I am a life coach, but I specialize in emotional intelligence and um, energy work. Do you have an LLC or is there an equivalent of that in that country? I'm sorry, say that again? Do you have an LLC or the equivalent of such, like a business yes. license? Yes, I do have a business license. I've had a business license for a couple of years now, but now the only time uh-huh. I'm like really using it <laughs> so, so it's, it, it, is it i mean i mean i know this sounds ignorant but is that called a, is it an llc or whatever is it the same you thing? have you can have a, you can have a sole proprietorship you can have a partnership yeah. you can have an llc it just depends on what kind of business you have yeah and they have the same kind of things yes and yes singapore wow and so is it filed in, is a singapore business or international yes. gotcha so where as you're um, uh as you're a, a life coach where are your clients coming from Coming from all over, actually. I have clients in Malaysia. I have clients in China. I have um, I've helped people because they're no longer clients. I've helped people who are in South Africa, in the States, in Australia. Um, so all over, really. How do you but find these word people? word of mouth so far. That's what I say. How do you find these people um, and how do they find you? Um, honestly, because I'm not really highly promoting it because I'm still trying to get the hang of, you know, timing and time zones and how to, you know, take care of people to the best of my ability without being, you know, tied to them hand and foot all the time. So um, originally what happened was I joined a coaching program and through Uh the coaching program, it was, it was referrals through them. And then from there, it's been social media referrals through social media. Gotcha. And, but no website or anything like that yet. I have a website. I have the website, but I'm going through another, uh, another overhaul of the website. So I started my website in June of 2017. And I created it, and I was happy, and I left it, and I didn't do anything with it. And then looking back at it now where I'm ready to start promoting programs, uh, I had to readjust. Yeah, so you're accepting money from all over the world, right? But what dollar yeah. did they use in Singapore, or did they convert it? It's a Singapore dollar. It's a Singapore okay. dollar. So the prices are in Singapore dollars. Um, I toured with the idea of doing it in USD because everyone understands USD. Yeah. But I went ahead with Singapore dollars. So is – and this is random tangent, is life coaching or therapy or counseling a, a taboo thing in Singapore or is it more normalized in Singapore? It's not normalized. And a lot of people look at me like, oh, yeah, life coaching, you made that up, didn't you? Uh, because right, a lot of people right. are still doing traditional counseling. But what I'm, what I'm finding is traditional counseling, I've been through tr- traditional counseling a couple of times. Uh, the very first time was while I was in my psych program in Bridgewater. And what I found was, because I am self-aware, 
because I try to put myself in the other person's shoes a lot. I can answer a lot of the questions uh, that the, the therapist will have, and a lot of times what they'll say is, oh, you don't need therapy. You understand. Yeah, I understand, but I'm still hurting. So um, that's why I went with life coaching. So I, I kind of like, I mean, I like therapy and all that. I like, I like therapy, but also like career coaching because I'm very action-oriented and step-oriented. Yes. Um, yes. And so while you do have, like, while I have self-awareness, like, yeah, this is what's going on with me, tell me what to do. And I like, or yes. not tell me what to do or help me discover what I want to do because obviously you want exactly. to discover, discover your own steps. So I kind of like I kind of like the idea of life coaching, but also career coaching, because it's very step mindset. Because I've heard of some people that have gone to a therapist for like five years, and they're still going to the therapist. And at this, at a certain point, I kind of like get to the point where I'm like, I want someone to be able to be self sufficient on their own and leave me. Yes. I don't yes. Know if that makes sense. And what I want is is it's not really solution based because there's no one solution for everybody, right? And that's where yeah. the guidance counseling part of me kind of kicks in. I yeah. want to get to know you. I want to know what drives you. So if I understand, you know, how to teach you, then I can help you discover what you need that's for right. yourself. And a lot of yeah. times it's like it's writing it out or speaking it out. And a lot of people don't want to say it out loud. A lot of people still want to hide stuff. And I understand, but I can tell because I've been through some of those things. So, yes, action-oriented, um, little steps. And it's not like, okay, think about this and I'll get back to you. Like, nah, I need to keep tabs on you because stupid things can happen. You can go off on a tangent. You can, like, you know. You can spiral into these, like, dark times sometimes just thinking about some of these things that hurt you, but I don't want that to happen. Where I will hold your hand and maybe, like, walk by you for a little while, I do eventually want you to be able to figure out when this happens next, I know what to do to figure it yeah. out. You have the coping skills yourself. Yeah. yeah. Now, so, so you're, you're doing this, um, and you're saying it's stigmatized, not stigmatized, but it's not normalized in Singapore. But let's bring it back to the... The small bubble, what about your family? What do they think about this adventure? My mom is cool. My yeah. brother is very excited for me. So those are my, the, my two supporters. Yeah. That's the family I have not told because it's one of those things where if I told them I quit my job, but I'm a single mom and I'm working for myself and I'm scraping by, the first thing all my uncles will say is, oh, but you need a job. You can't do this by yourself. You can't do this like this. You have to go get a job. And they'll like hassle me into getting a job. The way I see it, I can get a job whenever. I can get a job. So when did you I start? I have a limited amount of time to put, you know, my dreams into focus. So when did you quit the job, and when you're doing, when did you start? The... November of this past year. Oh wow, that's very. So I've been building, yeah, I've been building for like a year solid now. Um, like yeah. you know, I've I've got my own podcast. I've been doing this for a while, um, and quietly getting money to do, you know, coaching on the side. But now I'm like, I think I'm ready to go ahead and, you know, put the word out there and say, hey, if you want to talk, come get. Get at me. Let's talk. When, when did you discover that you wanted to do this full time and leave your job? Um, because what I find in the Singapore culture is, yes, I can yeah. get a job, but I probably won't stay there more than six months because something mm -hmm. stupid will happen and people don't want to. Okay, where the U.S. is very smart and they're learning from the billionaires before them, like Steve Jobs and, and um, you know, mm -hmm. Grant Cardo and people like that. You surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Why? Because you don't have every scope set available to you. Yeah. Eventually, yes, you might if you if you seek uh, education and you push yourself to you know grow in every direction possible. But yeah. until then, you have certain people that have the scope that you will need. So while they're very happy to hire here in Singapore people that have the credentials that they're looking for, they're not going to let you do your work or stand in your greatness to help them move forward. They're going to tie your hands and they're going to say, no, I want it done like this. Even though you know better and they hired you for that, they're not going to let you do that. It's very so subordinate. They want subordinates. They want yes people. I'm not a yes yeah. person. Yeah. So what, uh, would you ever move back to the United States? Maybe in the distant future, but right now because my daughter's in elementary school, I wanted to yeah. get to elementary school first. Maybe for high school. I don't know. Maybe for middle school. I'm not sure. You might but, do the same yeah, thing. At the moment, we're here for a little bit. Like the flip-flop, you might bring her to eighth grade over here in the United States. Maybe. I, I'm not sure. Um, it may be Australia. It may be, uh, it may be hmm. the U.K. I'm not sure. But the point is, I'm not worried about moving her because I know that's going to help her. It may not be comfortable at first, but it will help her in the long run. But right now, because the schooling is so rigorous in Singapore, elementary school, I can't afford to move her. Now, do you travel? Do you get an opportunity to travel and go to other, come back home, not home, but come back to you? Other that is part of the culture here. 
that is part of the culture here. So every summer, every break, like um, their big breaks are June for a month and then December for a month and a half, like November, December for a month and a half. And then in between each term, they have a whole week off. So a lot of kids will, you know, go off to Krabi, they'll go to Malaysia, they'll go to Bali, they'll go to, um, they'll go backpack through Europe. They'll do all of that stuff in their, you know, their break times or whatever. Right now I have a trip planned uh, in June. The second half of June I'm actually had, traveling to South Africa. I have a conference out there with uh, an old colleague of mine. And uh, we're going to go hit Kilimanjaro and then do this conference and come back home. But in the meantime, my, my daughter is going to Melbourne, which is where my brother is based, my youngest brother is based in Melbourne. Now, is this conference a leadership uh, coaching conference? It is. Um, it is a leadership conference. Uh, it's, it's like a panel of people who have been through the system uh, at the University of Cape Town. And okay. we're trying to teach kids to pursue their passion now while they're in school instead of doing what everyone's telling them to do because – Eventually, yes, okay, you could use your schools later on, but not always. How many of us have gone through college and then sat on the degree not doing anything with it until much later when they finally, mm. you know, found a job that fits? Interesting, and that's true. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we're almost at 50 minutes, but, you know, I got the big part of the show, and it might be long. Yeah. It's called uh, Shot for Shot. Have you heard that part of the show before? So no, shot I for, haven't. Shot for Shot means that, you get to ask me any question that's not even related to this show at all, and I get to ask you any question that's not related to this show at all. Uh, do you want to go first or I go first? You can go first. Um, dang, I already had it and then I lost <laughs> it. I, I, no, no, I do have my question. All right, so you you are a leadership coach, emotional coach. Um, it's kind of not even related. What inspires you? Uh, what? And I'll give you the categories and you can pick ones off the hands. Okay. So, what music? inspires you what book inspires you what movie inspires you uh i'll be random and say what food inspires you and then what person so i'm gonna do that but i'll do i'll go oh, i'll go indiv i'll go individually okay <laughs> so what what music inspires you it really depends on my i am a true pisces it depends on my mood which is probably why i'm in intelligence oriented stuff anyway uh music if i am angry it yeah. will probably be Little Wayne to kind of walk me out of whatever I'm going through. Um, okay. If it's, it's, you know, happy music, um, yeah. anything that I can dance to, I love to dance. So okay. any of the Step Up soundtrack, I, I'm big on soundtracks. Step Ups, you, you like to do them just with that Bama dance in the rain, and it's like not even raining, and they do the little water dance. Like, yes, all that. I know, you know, I know what you're uh, talking about. You're straight up. You are a like a train line, but not really. You're a, 90, you're a 90s child. Okay, so that was that was music. What book inspires you? Um, a lot of different books. The recently um, was The Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes. I really, really connected with who she is and what she stands for, how she goes about life. Okay, what movie inspired you? It depends. There are a lot of sports movies in there, like Remember the Titans and Coach Carter yeah. and, yeah. you know, all of those. So um, it depends. But I... Based on my emotional coaching, I use movies and music a lot. So what I will do is I'll try and get the, the client to actually give me their favorite movie and the character they, they identify with so I can understand who they, you know, what they're going through a little bit more. I'll go back right. and watch the movie just to well, figure it out. You're helping me with my question. So what character, uh, do you, <laughs> what character of a fictional show, movie, whatever, do you identify with the most? Oh, man. Oh, there's so many. Recently, I really identified with Lucifer. Lucifer from what, that Fox show? Yes. I don't even know that wow. show. Wow. I loved it only because, you know, he was kind of looking at humanity with completely different eyes. Like he'd never experienced some of these things before. He's looking for people to, you know, go with their guttural passions rather than understanding, you know, relationships. And I, I love that. His perspective was awesome. All right. And then what, what food inspires you? Food in general inspires me. I love to eat. Oh. I love to cook. But you um, said, I what's like your style? exploring new stuff. I'm and what you say, what's your favorite style? You said Mexican is your style? You like to cook uh, Mexican? It's not my favorite style, but it, it's missing in Singapore, so I tend to make a lot of Mexican food here because I can't find it anywhere else. But I make a lot of soul food. I make a lot of Indian food. I, I make a lot of everything. All right, I like baking a lot. I hit, you, I, hit you, I hit you with the round, so now you can hit me with any question you want. Not related wow. to this podcast um, or this episode. What got you started with the podcast? Why did you start the podcast? Why a podcast? Because I got a face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> no. If you say so, whatever. No, no um, because 
I was doing YouTube videos in my car, and I realized it was boring to just look at me in a car. And then I then I learned that I didn't even know what podcast was, but I heard that like you can have your own radio show, and like yep. you can just you can say whatever you want and then post it. And that just sounded very appealing to me. And it was pretty pretty much that. I mean, it's, uh, a lot of people think I have some overarching, super scientific or deep meaning other than it was easy for me to figure out. And uh, I asked my friend, my boy Sam Nang, um, he had a friend named Dean Picari. So Sam Nang introduced me to Dean who had a, who does not had, does have a very uh, well-known or sustainable podcast that he made income off of. I, I don't make income off of this. And <laughs> I, I called him for, th- I called him and he talked to me for like an hour and a half and he told me everything I needed to do to start a podcast, and he made it sound so easy that I was like, okay, I'll do it. And so, that, I mean, that's really, that's the, like, a lot of people think I can overcomplicate it, but that's pretty much the, the easy part of it was I tell people that, for me, podcasting was an opportunity for me to have a lane and say what I want and share a message, and it's, and it was easy, and I can do it, and I figured it out. So, you know, not a lot of things are, you know, super complex it could be very simplistic like i just felt like yep. doing it i just felt like doing it was it an easy yes but i totally hear that because you know you're trying to figure out where you can you where you can find your voice or whatever and yes that was an easy yes and i'm glad you i'm glad you're doing it yeah i mean it was, and it's fun i mean obviously i was like okay i get yeah. a mic i get on a mic i talk uh, i i edit it a little bit not really because i'm not really like doing it's not like a narrative podcast it's just me talking to my right. friends, my friends and family yeah. and then i and then i post it and that's it and if people, I was, I had the mindset of two people listen to it. I didn't care. Like, I still don't care. I really don't care. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty. Um, I keep track of like who's listening, or I, I, I definitely do it consistently. Like, I, you know, like I do it every Mondays to have an audience. But at the same time, if five people, if a hundred people listen to it and I never heard from any of them, I still do it. It's just, it, I do get a little bit of affirmation when some people say I listen to your podcast I enjoy it but if I never got that I think I still would do it just because I felt like it and I, I don't like and, and honestly, I, I, I like the note, topics yes absolutely um so but on that note Singapore right you need an aggregator to get on iTunes and Spotify whereas it's, an aggregator have, it's a it's like a third party something that will help you get onto iTunes and uh Spotify. Oh. you need to pay for that though so whereas in the U.S., all you need to pay for is SoundCloud, and it will put you on, or it will you pay for you don't even pay for Anchor. Anchor will put you on straight away. So yeah. well, I, I I do pay. I I use Libsyn, um, but yeah, I like I, I like Libsyn because it it will blast it to all the avenues that you want. It's a hosting site. But besides yeah. Libsyn, um, like I said, it's my voice, and I can, I you know, it's funny is through this podcast, I made new friends, and I that's mm-hmm. that's a big that's a big thing for me. Uh, through this podcast, I learn new skills. So, like, I can tell people, like, they're like, oh, my God, it's really hard. Well, I learned how to – I technically learn how to do audio editing because I look at YouTube videos. Uh, yes. I learned how to use social media better and make posts and use Instagram and Twitter better. Um, it, it, yeah. For me, this podcasting thing just made me a better professional in other things outside of my podcast. So it's just been fun. I think the root of this whole thing – if I can simp- like make it the very simple answer, like why I do a podcast, because it's fun and I get to talk. <laughs> like that's it. Yes. So, so that's I good. Agree. So this is the part of the episode you have uh, your lane, uh, shout outs and plugs, meaning shout outs your friends and family, whoever you want to shout out and plugs, any ventures, links, uh, social media that people can follow you. This is your platform to say whatever you want to say. So for all of you listening, thank you so much for taking the time. Phil, thank you so much. You, if you haven't listened to any other episodes of Positive Phil, to go back and listen to him because he does have a lot of good things to say, and it's always upbeat. There's there's nothing in there that I've heard that was you know complaining or you know bashing anything. So he has he has a good spin on everything for the most part from from what I've heard anyway. Um, what else? Let's see. If you want to follow me, please do. I'd be so grateful. Uh, you can find me anywhere on social media. If you go to Google and search R A S A T H one, you will immediately get my website. You'll get uh, SoundCloud, you'll get Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all of that. So you'll be able to find me no matter where. Um, what else? If you are interested in actually learning more and connecting with more people, there is a summit coming up, so stay tuned on my Instagram page. I'm more, mostly active on Instagram if you need anything. 
Yeah. So are you doing? Are you, no, I didn't get kicked off. Okay. I was I was just taking a I was just taking okay. a picture. Um, okay. What what what's the website? R a s h e h one dot com. Now okay. all these. I try to be really branded all across everything. So with that being said, I want you to uh, make sure you put all those information, all the links, all that in the show notes that we have together, so I can make sure to yep. put that on social media for everyone. It's been great. You're my first international guest. Um, well, not first international person, but my first uh, person that's. Person what time is it? Overseas. Yeah, what time is it over there? It, it is 12:40 in the afternoon on Monday. Oh wow, you're living life. I'm. It's nighttime for me, and I'm about to go to bed. I'm like. You need to go to sleep. Time. Yes. Past my bedtime, but um, this is pretty amazing. Um, the the smallness of the world. You know, you got a person now. You got Kevin Ma and me in Virginia to rep yeah. your um, to rep your business and your your venture to to watch you uh, grow with your stuff. And now you got I got now I got a person in Singapore if I ever become internationally famous, which probably won't happen. But absolutely. If I, randomly, Don't say that. If, if I randomly <laughs> pop up in Singapore, I, I know where I can go. I got now. I got a person. You in better England. let me know. I got a person in England. I got a person in Singapore. Which how many people can say that they know someone in Singapore? I can't. So, thank you so much for being on the episode. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for the episode. Uh, uh, you can always be on there again. Um, maybe we'll maybe we'll touch base. I like to touch base with guests again. Maybe a year from now we do a little update <laughs> episode to see what has happened or transpired. I'll be excited to follow along um, with your journey, and we're out. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends, and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.